Chris, you just come back from overseas. Can you tell us how long you've been back, where you were, and what happened while you were there? Sure. First thing I'll say is, whenever you visit somebody that does TV shows, this is what happens, okay? <laughs> so completely unprepared. Um, I've been in Abu Dhabi for about three and a bit years. Um, Abu Dhabi is in the United Emirates. Um, it's based in the Middle East. Um, you'll know, everybody knows the Arabian Gulf. You know it as the Persian Gulf, but everybody hates that name. It's actually the Arabian Gulf. Anybody from the Arab world, it's the Arabian Gulf. Um, and the UAE is a small, small place along the coast there, uh, next to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and uh, you'll know Bahrain, Qatar, and Kuwait. So the UAE is in that area. And I've been there for three and a bit years, and I've just been back three months. And why did you go there in the first place? Well, nothing really glamorous, really. My wife wanted to work abroad, so I was just a flunky sidekick for a change. My wife's been really good and gone lots of places with me, so I said, OK, we're off. And what, what work does and she do? She's a teacher. She's a great, she's a primary school teacher, which makes us fit really well because I'm just a child. And so she works all the time. Um, so we went, and I didn't really know what to expect. I was like most people. You know, I thought people run around with sheets trying to cut my head off and all that stupid rubbish that's on TV about the Middle East and it's nothing like that at all. It's a wonderful country, wonderful people. Um, I met loads of people from other parts of the Middle East like Jordan, um, Palestine, um, Lebanon, Beirut. I got to teach a martial arts class in the Palestinian refugee camp in the middle of Beirut in Lebanon, which is pretty cool, really. Uh, not anything I ever expected when I was first my first martial arts class in the Yorkshire Mining Village, I can tell you that. Um, but it was great. Uh, I got to, I followed my wife. Um, I didn't know what I'd be doing, to be honest with you, Tony. I, I had no idea, really. Um, I walked into a martial arts club gym because I just wanted to train. And Marcus de la Cruz Oliveira was there. Um, big, big, big. Uh, jiu-jitsu boy massive and it was in set up Abu Dhabi top team and won ADC and what have you so I'm sorry if I think some of the things I say aren't completely right it's just because I've talked to him and I've not done a research but Marcus was there and he was teaching and, um, and I remember him saying have you ever done MMA and I said well I've done a bit and they went well you should try it you'll like it and I said no it's okay I'll just watch so I watched the first session and it was really funny and, um, and then I said, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll probably come back and train. And so I, I came back and Marcus was actually leaving. I didn't know it was his last session. So I came and they went, oh, we've got no teacher. And they said, so you've done MMA before? I said, yeah, I have. And they said, well, what have you done? And you know what it's like when somebody asks you stuff like that. You feel, you, you feel really, it's a Kiwi thing, isn't it? You, you don't want to say anything because you sound like a noter. And I've been in New Zealand long enough that I'm a Kiwi. So it was easy. I just said, look, just Google Chris Easley, have a look, and if you think I'll, I'd be okay, I'll do a session and we'll see how we go. And so I lived five minutes away from the gym. By the time I'd walked to my apartment, they'd already rung me and said, we'd like you to teach class. And that's how it started. And what I didn't know, though, was the guy who ran the jiu-jitsu there, Amar, was one of the first Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts in the whole of the Middle East. And people like... Um, Hoist would drop in and say hello, Hoist Gracie. Um, like John, John Tung, who's a Filipino-based UFC fighter, Marcus is his coach. And I ended up training with all these different people and teaching MMA, and it was amazing. Uh, what people don't know is that Jiu-Jitsu in the UAE is a school subject. So you go to school and you'll do like history, you'll do geography, and then your next class will be Jiu-Jitsu. And there are hundreds of Brazilians in the UAE who teach jiu-jitsu. So it's, it's everywhere. So our class, our club was, was not the biggest. Um, the biggest is probably Al Jazeera, and there's another one next to it. And they have lots of professional fighters, you have uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters. Um, and one school, which is a, a little bit bigger than Al Jazeera, has three levels for classes. There are hundreds of people who train every day, hundreds. And every school has a jiu-jitsu teacher, every boys' school has a jiu-jitsu teacher. Um, so on a Saturday afternoon, we'd like to have an open mat. 
So any day there'd be anywhere from 20 to 30 black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people from different levels, from black belt through to third down and what have you. And it would be open mat, so we'd all have a role. And it was really funny because we'd have a role that I, I do MMA. So for me, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I train at in that I don't want to get swept and I don't want to get tapped. If I can do those two things, and even if I'm underneath, I can not get tapped, I'm re I consider it that I've, I've held my own, if not won. Because at the end of the round, we get to stand up and I can hit you again. So that's sort of what I use it for. I love it, but that's what I use it for. So when I play with the boys, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I've only got a, a blue belt. I mean, I've trained a million years, you know what I mean? But I've just a blue belt. So we'd have a play and they'd go, you're not a blue belt. I said, well, I am, because it's the only one I can wear. Um, but I really do MMA and, and no gi. And um, so we'd have a play, and then it'd be a game to see, they'd try and see if they could sweep me or they could tap me. And if I lasted more than like a minute, two minutes, I'd go, I won, I won, and then hate it. <laughs> but it was still, they were good guys, you know, they, they, they were really good guys, and it was a lot of fun. And from there, um, I got asked if I'd be involved in, there was a, 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 a fight circuit, uh, well, a promotion called Desert Force at the time. And they went all across the Middle East. And it was a, pro a professional show. It was on TV. And just to give you an idea, NBC was a TV company that ran it. And they have a potential audience of about 1.2, 1.3 billion. So it's not a small show. Now uh, NBC have Brave, and which is a show that most people know, a lot of people know now. And they had Phoenix before that. But it was Desert Force first. So I got involved in that and provided a couple of fighters who I trained for, trained for, and I did some refereeing and some judging. And then there was a, a, a quite a big show in Jordan, and I went to do that, and I met Mark Goddard. You'll all know who Mark Goddard is. And Mark talked to me about IMAF, uh, International Mixed Martial Arts Amateur Federation. And they're enormous now, and now they're linked up with WAMA, uh, it's IMAF and WAMA, pretty much run the whole of the world for amateur mixed martial arts. And their goal in 2028 is to get into the Olympics. So Mark is their official, uh, official official, I suppose. He runs all the officials and teachers and runs courses. And so I actually already had a, a qualification from a guy called Blake Rice for ABC, American Boxing Commission. And I'd had a, a qualification here and what have you. So I went, yeah, okay, I'll, I'd, I'd love to get involved in that. So I paid all my own fare. So all you kids who complain about you're not getting paid for martial arts, welcome to the world of us old people, because we never got paid for martial arts. And if you counted all the money that we've spent around the world to do martial arts, yours is a pittance. You've got an apprenticeship to do. So anyway, I paid my money to go to Ireland, paid for the course. Even though I had all these things, I still did the same thing that we're used to from when we were kids. I paid all my own money, went to Ireland, did a course, met some really good people, got to work, got to do some stuff in, um, in uh, Kavanagh's gym in Ireland and where uh, Connor was and what have you. Um, and I got qualified as a, as a judge with Mark Goddard. And then I started to work some of the shows and Mark was really good, he, he looked after me, very much so. Um, and then I got involved with IMAF, and I judged the World Championships. Because um, I don't want to bore you with a history lesson, but I had a lot of history for MMA in New Zealand. And then MMA in New Zealand took a turn that I didn't want to get involved with, with somebody who tried to control it. And I, I just like training, I'm not into politics. So I'd left MMA for a long time. And I got back into it through Mark and through Desert Force and then Phoenix and Brave and IMAF. And, and I reconnected with Kiwis that you will know, people like Mark Craig, people like Neil Swales, people like Terry Hill. And I reconnected and it was wonderful. And it's been an absolute honeymoon from coming back and, and being back in a sport that I started. I know it sounds big-headed, but I did. And, and I'm... And, like I said, I didn't like where it was going, so I didn't really want to get involved. And now I love the people who are in it. I love the honesty and the integrity of those people. And their desire, really, is the same as mine, to make MMA back where it was. 
And so I got involved in that and I went and did the World Champs in Bahrain a year ago. And then I went to Melbourne, again, paying myself, right? And I did the, I was gonna do the judging, but my boss now asked me to help on the other side of things. Then he asked me to come to Romania and then I've just done the World Championships again. Um, and I was a backstage manager, I, I ran the backstage. And to give you an idea, there was 374 athletes. Um, uh, five days of competition, obviously I was there for longer than five days. On the first day there was 88 fights. There were four cages and on the second day there was 96 fights. So there has never ever been an MMA event like it ever in the history of the world or in our sport. Last year there was three cages, but this year there was four. And there was just under 400 fights, which is phenomenal. There was a team of officials run by Mark who did a great job, referees, judges, you know, time kit, all those things. There was um, us in the back, there's the equipment people. They were great, Janie, Sharon, and Ryan. There was, uh, in the back with us, there was Steve Steele, I know his name, it sounds like a, a like an American film star. Steve Steele is such a cool dude from LA. There was um, Ben and there was Ryan who were all working with us backstage. Um, Ralph, who was the uh, um, regulator and inspector, he ran for all the fairness and the rules and this is how it should be. And all the way through to Alistair who was the tournament's director and boss. So all this massive team of people, and they, um, we put this thing together. And what you don't know, which is wonderful, is we have a New Zealand girl who is a two times world champion. We have three world champions in New Zealand. And you never know, because nobody knows about MMA anymore, but there were, there's three of them. So there you go, that was but <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're back here now, and you're going to carry on with your with your role, your uh, a leading role here now in New Zealand, and you hope to be able to um, build the game here even bigger than yeah. it is, and and keep and get involved more overseas. Uh, absolutely, I mean it's an unprecedented unprecedented time in New Zealand. We have, if you wanted to include two other people. We have seven Kiwis who are involved in the UFC. We have five home-based ones. You know, Shane Young, Kai Francis, Luke Jumia, Dan Hooker, and of course Israel Adesina, right? But we have five guys who are in there. It's unprecedented that a small country like us would have such great representation. And if you include Mark Hunt and Robert Whittaker, I know he's obviously, but he's really a Kiwi boy, right? He won't like saying that. But that's seven people. That's enormous for us, but you would never really know because we don't have enough of a profile. One of my jobs that I hope I can do, and I've asked Tony here because he was always behind the camera, so I'm going to talk about Tony now, is I've asked Tony to help because we need to raise the profile of MMA. And we need whoever sees this, I don't know who will or who won't, but we need you to help us to get the rest of the country to realize just how big a deal it is for us in our sport. And how our sport is, is bordering on the brink of, of missing out on that. Because we need to be a lot bigger, we need to be a lot higher profile, and we need people want to know about our world champions. So if you include our three world amateur champions and our five homegrown people, we have eight people who are in the top echelon of MMA across the world. And how cool is that? But you'd never know. And it drives me mad because I look at them and I look at where we started and where we are now and what we have now. And I could never have dreamed that in those days. And I'm so proud of them. We've got Eugene Einstein, right? You would have to say he's one of the top coaches in the world now. Right? You've got Jason Vorster, you've got Steve Oliver. I know you know sort of maybe who Steve Oliver is, but what you don't know is Steve's the first Kiwi who went to Brazil and won the world title for Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Brazil. So he's the first Kiwi that did that. You might not know that, but he did. Right? 
So we have this incredible base of talent within our small country um, that nobody knows about, or some do, but not many. So my job is to try and get that out there. My job is to try and get more people doing MMA, trying to get more people trying out for New Zealand teams in MMA to travel the world. There is the European Open Championships. There's the Asian Open Championships. There's the African Open Championships. There's the Pan American Open Championships. There's the Oceania Open Championships. And there's the World Championships. That is a world stage. That there is the opportunity for Kiwis to be on. And we're talking the amateur side there, not the professional. The professional is, you've got Brave, Bellator, 1FC, you've got Phoenix, you've got um, the top of the ring at the moment, UFC, you've got 1FC, you've got Eve Ting. When you start talking about these people, you start realising that, my goodness, there's a lot of talent in New Zealand and they're on a world stage. And that's my job, or actually it's Tony's job now because I'm just giving it to him, is we need to get this message out. We need to know who these people are. We need to know who to talk to. Because the media in New Zealand, the mainstream media, and I don't blame them, but they don't know about us because we don't tell them about us. We have to take responsibility to give them the opportunity to know about us. Then we can blame them. But you can't blame them if they don't know us. So everybody, get involved. Get part of it. Chris Easley. 27 5555 or easily Christopher at hotmail.com that shows you how old I am right or Facebook but be in touch help us to grow this sport brilliant mate Is that all right great talking to you fantastic thank hey listen thanks and like I said just be prepared when you come to visit Tony to talk about stuff. He's going to put a camera in Charlie and just make you <laughs> off the cuff do some stuff. Cheers.